Well, we started last week a brand new series called It's Like This, looking at the parab- some of the parables that Jesus told. We remember that parables are stories that are relatable on an earthly context. They, they give us pictures of things that we can understand, but then there's a flip side to those, that those earthly stories reveal a heavenly truth about God's kingdom and about God's power. And this morning, we're going to look at a story about a fig tree that didn't blossom, that they had no fruit upon its vine. And as we move into this, you know, I believe that God is going to just inspire us and move in our lives to show us that he has purposed us to be a fruitful people. But I want to encourage you just for the next few moments, just to close your eyes and just to ask and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you through his word. Father, your word, the word of God, the Bible, is truth. It's unchanging. It's got the ability to cut through the stuff in our lives, to reveal things of your purposes and your kingdom. And in these still moments, we invite you, by your Holy Spirit, to take your word and just to really pinpoint it into our lives. And I pray that your spirit will bring life through your word into every single life that's here this morning and every single life that's watching online. May you encounter the spirit of God speaking to you in Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, you might want to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. You may prefer to follow it on the screen. Those watching online will be able to see the verses come up. We're going to look at Luke 13 verses 1 to 8. And it says this. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now just stop a moment, that's not a parable. That's Jesus engaging with a crowd about some factual things that have happened. We're not really, um, history doesn't really reveal much to us about that first part, about Pilate mixing blood with sacrifices. And in a sense, it's not that crucial that we understand exactly what's being said there. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But then Jesus told of another event. This wasn't a, a parable. This was an event where a tower of Siloam probably built next to, you would read of a pool of Siloam where often those with illness would wait on the side for the waters to be stirred and they would aim to be the first one to get into the pool and then many people would get healed. And it was possible there was a tower built to that and it collapsed and actually had killed 18 people, Jesus refers to here. Now, let me tell you why it's important that I just include that part. Because God's um, not accidental in how he writes his word and how he's worked with his authors to construct this. And that is that this was really Jesus engaging with a religious group of people that were saying that because people had suffered and people had died, that they must have been terrible sinners. That's what they were saying. This was religion expressing a sense of condemnation and feeling quite smug about their life and about their well-being and saying, because they died, they must have been terrible sinners before God. And Jesus doesn't disagree with them. But he does say this, you're all sinners. There's a level playing field by the side of the cross, guys. There's not a tier system when we come to the cross of some people who need forgiveness more than others. I don't care if your background has been one of criminality. I don't care what you've been up to in your past. The reality is this, that you need a savior, that you need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus doesn't come to condemn us, 
to say, oh, you really need me. Jesus comes with good news to say, you can know freedom from your sin, but it happens when you lay low before me, when you repent, when you acknowledge that you were wrong and you receive my life. And then we, as we looked at a few weeks ago, experienced resurrection power in newness of life. But verse six onwards is now moving onto the parable. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, then fine. If not, then I will cut it down. What a, an unusual story. It's just that expression that Jesus would have been speaking of horticultural things that the readers would have understood and they would have known that fig trees were supposed to bear figs. Otherwise, it would just be a tree rather than a fig tree. You know, you, you and I know, you may not be into gardening, but if someone tells you you have an apple tree in your garden, you expect it to grow apples. If you um, are living in a far more um, beautifully warm climate than even Devon is at the moment, isn't this gorgeous? Uh, you know, if you're watching from other parts in the world, and we here, we were warmer than some of your parts this last week. And we feel, you know, the news in the UK goes nuts. When it always lists, you know, we're warmer than Spain, we're warmer than Italy, we're warmer than the Bahamas, we're hotter than the sun. You know, it lists all these things. And uh, we feel really pleased with that, but we make the most of it as well. We have barbecues in 12 degrees because we never know if that's the best we're going to get. And so we make the most of it. But if you live in a warmer climate, you may have a banana tree. And what do you expect it to grow? Bananas. And here was a man who had a fig tree. And he expected on this fig tree for figs to grow. Very clear and very understandable for each of us. But we read that the figs were not growing. Now, I'm going to just give a number of interpretations of this. And I'm going to, just for a few moments, I'm going to talk about some bigger issues and I'm going to bring into some more issues within our lives. But you read some commentators about this very story and they will say that this fig tree is symbolic of Israel, of the Jews. Now, God has shown great favor to his people, the Jews, the nation of Israel throughout history. All of these stories that we have in the Old Testament, they're all of God's work. You know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of Israel. And then we see that the lineage of Jesus coming through. And we see that Jesus was born to no other nation on the earth, but he was born to the Jews. He was a Jew. And we see that God's favor has been upon that, that culture, on that nation, and on those people. And I believe that still resides today. You know, and in fact, the scripture tells us that we are to pray for Israel, that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I find it fascinating that throughout history, that nation has been the target of so much discrimination. You know, we've just remembered just this last you know, few weeks, some of the Holocaust tragedies and awful atrocities that took place. And we see that how, how could someone be so loathing of a nation and of a race to do such horrific things to them? And yet we see that it's not just man that has had that discrimination, but we look that there is, uh, behind that, there is a hate in the spirit. That there is whoever God shows favor on that the enemy, the devil, Satan, we don't talk about that too much in church today, it would seem, but there's a real enemy 
There's real powers of darkness that try and attack and thwart the purposes of God. And we see the enemy, whether it's been through pharaohs in the Old Testament, whether it's been through invading nations, whether it's been through the leader of a, of a, you know, a, a, a German um, invasion um, back in World War II, wherever it's come from, we see that there's an enemy who has tried to wipe that nation out. And Jesus came to bring hope to the Jews. Now, some commentators will say that the three years that Jesus went and, or or that the gardener walked among the vineyard was like the three years of Jesus' earthly ministry. And that they weren't receiving his message. And they were going to be given a little bit more time. But there's another interpretation that says that maybe the three years were like three periods of history. And now we're in the fourth period. And I'm so glad that right across the world, there are Jews, Messianic Jews, who have discovered their Savior. I'm, I'm so pleased if you meet someone who has got a Jewish heritage, and we have a few in this church here, but that they have discovered that Jesus wasn't just someone who came in and just spouted some good ideas, but Jesus was in fact the Messiah that the Old Testament had foretold over hundreds of years, and the Messiah had come to bring hope and light to that nation. In fact, we read as we go on to the New Testament that the early apostles, that they had an issue with the gospel being preached to non-Jews, or as the New Testament calls us, Gentiles. And we see that, uh, that God had to really speak to Peter, in particular, to open his eyes that actually the gospel wasn't just a message for the Jews, but it was a gospel for the whole of creation, for the whole of the world. And I want to encourage us, I want us to be a church that gives thanks to God for that heritage, for, that, for the favor of God upon the Jewish nation. And I want us to be a church that continues to pray that the eyes of that nation will be opened up to see the Messiah and will experience the fullness of salvation in their lives. And, and I believe that you know, God is a God of patience and love and a God who is doing his utmost to communicate. And we read and we understand that there are people all over the world who have Jewish ancestry that are discovering Jesus. And we praise God for that. But there's another interpretation to this. Because we are described as the Gentiles who have been grafted in. We've been brought in to the purposes that God has for us. In fact, Paul writing says, there are neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free man. And he lists all the comparatives to say that in Christ, we are all in need of a savior and we have all been offered that great salvation within our lives. And I just want to unpack a little bit of why I believe some of the key things Jesus was saying here. You see, in the first few verses of this chapter before we get into the parable, we see that the religious people's expectation was to look for sin in people's lives. Religious people do that. If, um, in fact, let's not talk about religious people like as if they're someone else. There's a temptation in your heart and in my heart when we look at someone to see the sin. And if you can't acknowledge that, then you're probably even more religious than you think you are. Because the reality is that we find it so easy to spot things that are not right. I've just been doing an interview online with those watching and was asked a question about what's some of the things that most um, frustrate me or challenge me about the understanding of the church and the gospel message in the general world, and it's that people outside the church consider those inside the church to be judgmental. And that's so anti-Jesus, because that's, that's the mode of those who are asking Jesus the questions here. It's not the mode of the Savior. His mode was something completely different, and it was this, that he looks at people, and he doesn't see sin, he sees fruitfulness. When Jesus looks at you, 
When he looks at us who've been forgiven and had our shame lifted off our lives and no longer to be a part of us, will not be a part of our future because they have been dealt with once and for all. Jesus looks at your life and he sees fruit, fruitfulness. You are a, a fruitful vine planted by God. And there are some possible interpretations of what Jesus was saying here in this parable because on one level we could interpret this that Jesus is like an Ofsted inspector walking into the garden of our lives, walking around. You know, if you're, if you're in teaching, you will not need me to say that when I mention the word Ofsted that there are shivers up and down your spine. That there's, a, there's a, an anxiety that comes. In fact, they don't tell schools more than 24 hours in advance, I understand, that they are going to have an Ofsted inspection, probably because the majority of the teaching staff will go off sick. <laughs> but it certainly will be that they will change things just for the inspection and they want to catch them by surprise. But there is a fear and an anxiety that the default position of the inspector is that they want to find what's wrong. And it would be easy to read this story and to understand it in a way that says Jesus is coming to find what is wrong. But Jesus is not inspecting the vine to see what is wrong because he is coming to say, there is fruit in this. There is fruit in this vine. And why is it not producing fruit? Because it's purpose to grow fruit. It's purpose to flourish. It's purpose to abound in that which has been created to abound in. And when Jesus looks at your life, as he walks around you now, he's not a cynical Ofsted inspector looking to fail you in your Christian faith. He is affirming you to say, there is fruit in you. There is fruit in you. Right in the very center of your purpose and your existence, he has placed within you fruitfulness. And if you're not displaying it, there's something he wants to help with. But he's not cynically looking to fail us. You know, it may be that an Ofsted inspector goes into a school and looks at some of the artwork of the kids and says, it's not up to standard. And those kids, they take the artwork home to their parents and their parents proudly display it on the fridge. You see what, a, a, what a, an inspector writes off, a father appreciates. And we have a father who gathers alongside us and says, I have made you to be fruitful. And he loves to see the fruit in our lives. Fruitfulness is joyous. When in the Old Testament it says, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Joy was understood to be the fruit of the land. You look at the promises of entering into the place of, of the, the land of promise, that they often come back and say, it's a land flowing with milk and honey and the grapes are the size of you know, melons. They're incredible. And God has designed fruitfulness to be a joyous outworking and celebration of those, those things that he's placed within us. Fruitfulness is the result of stewarding God's work. But I want to talk about four ways that we live that can work against a heavenly father drawing fruitfulness out of our lives. First one is this. We live under fear of the inspection. We live under fear. Do you know what? Right at the heart of, of religion is a fear of being rejected. There are people who work hard. They're conscientious. They, if we talk about some of those in the New Testament times, in the Gospels, they would go into the synagogues and they would publicly place the big offerings they would wear the long robe signifying how many hours they spent in prayer. And they would try and convince people that they were elevated to a place that really 
was a manifestation of a fear that they would not be accepted with God. The scripture says that perfect love casts out fear. In God, who the Bible says is not just a loving God, he is love. If you were to do a PhD and multiple PhDs on the character of the love of God, if you kept digging and digging and digging right to the very epicenter, you would not find love to be an emotion. You would find love to have its eminence and its significance and its core within the character and the person of God. Because God is love. And perfect love casts out fear. But let me tell you what religion does. It causes people to sellotape plastic fruit onto their lives. It gets people to pretend. So if we have an environment here in this church that is an environment of fear, not love, where people are trying to look spiritual because they think that will give them acceptance, what they will probably do is to go and buy some plastic apples, some plastic bananas, and stick it onto their lives and say, I'm growing fruit just so I can fit in and blend in with everyone else. Do you know what happens to those churches? And, the de- and this is not about other churches, this is a danger for all of us. That we end up to be congregations full of people that are all carrying plastic fruit, trying to keep up with everybody else's plastic fruit. And we end up with a lack of transparency and a lack of openness. We end up with people having struggles in life that don't find help for their struggles because they're too busy sellotaping plastic fruit onto their lives. And they don't deal with the core issue of why they're not life-filled. Why is there no fruit growing in their lives? And it becomes a facade. You know, it's so encouraging. I sent some of you in an email this week that hearing stories of people who are getting fresh understanding of the life of God while they're doing the Freedom in Christ course right now. It's wonderful to see people begin to say, I I experience in the life of God, it's bringing liberty, freedom, it's taking away my fears, and I'm seeing a new fruitfulness in my life. But fear produces plastic, pretend fruit. I love hanging around people who are real and honest and say it as it is. It's really awkward, isn't it, when there are elephants in the room in a conversation, when everybody's pretending that it's really not as bad as everybody can see that it is. If we're going to be a people of love, we have to be a people of sincerity and a people of authenticity and a people who will be patient when someone's life is not fruitful, that we don't condemn them, but that we say, let's give this some more time and let's help with the reasons why there is no life flowing here. So some live under fear. Secondly, some live under inadequacy. There are people who will walk into a room like this and they will do a measurement test got a friend of mine who will often when he speaks at big conferences he says I've got a word for someone here God has shown me who the worst Christian is in this room right now and I'm going to point you out and you're going to speak something over your life and everybody's thinking oh no I'm going to be exposed (laughs) most people think it's them most people conclude that they are not as good or as adequate as other people. And there are people who say, yes, I, I, I understand that multi-talented Andrew Davis can be a fruit bearer. I understand that Sues can be a fruit bearer. I understand. And you look around and you see people and you think, I understand how these people can be fruit bearers. But for me, no, 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 no. But I want you to know, the Father, as he walks around your life, he sees fruit. Whatever your journey has been, the Father sees fruitfulness within you. And if it's not coming out of you, there's something that needs to change. 
Inadequacy says, I can't be fruitful. It says, I'm going to fail. Maybe past attempts at growing fruit. Have you ever seen an apple tree straining? There's an apple in here somewhere, I'm going to get it out. I've never seen one of those things happen. It, it happens as a sign of life. You know, sometimes we think, do you know if I'm just a bit more serious in my prayer, that if I just strain a bit longer, if I push a bit harder, then maybe God will break through for me. You understand it wrong, my friend. Breakthrough doesn't come because you strain harder. Breakthrough comes because you let go and you let God. Faith. It's not trying harder. Faith is letting go. Faith is releasing your own desire to get your own resources to solve this. And if you think the number of hours that you pray directly relates to the the produce of that process, then you think that you're doing it in your strength. And that can actually be less faith-filled than even not praying at all. No, I'm not saying you don't pray. But I'm saying in relationship, we stop trying to make things happen in our own strength and we let God do his work. Maybe past fruitfulness haunts you, fruitlessness haunts you. It's convinced you that you can't be fruitful. Let me tell you what's going to happen in a few moments' time. I... Annie, one of the beautiful ladies here in the church, she was over in Israel recently and she brought me back some oil from Israel, some anointing oil. And towards the end of this time together this morning, we're going to have a time when I'm going to encourage us all to anoint one another to be fruitful. And we're going to release one another. Now, if you're here for the first time and you think, I don't get this, then you can feel completely free just to watch and observe what's taking place. But I believe that's going to be symbolic of what God has already done. He's already anointed you to be fruitful. And if you're not being fruitful, then God isn't giving up on you. He's saying, let's do something about this. So some live under fear, some live under, under inadequacy, but there are some who live under apathy they take a, hey, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be type of approach to their fruitfulness as believers. They sort of think, hopefully we'll grow some fruit. But really, they're not really full of expectation and hope. They're not really convinced by a revelation that God's calling to be fruitful people. Fourthly, as well as living under fear, living under inadequacy and living under apathy, they live under, and this is what I pray each of us will be under, that we live under fruitful expectation. That they wake up in the morning and say, today, I'm going to be fruitful. Not because it's mind over matter, but because it's God's word over my word. Because it's God's truth over my circumstance. Because it's his reality over my reality because I walk by faith and not by sight. And I know that I'm going to be fruitful. That I will release fruitfulness in others. That I will be someone that gets alongside people and releases that fruit in their life also. And I know which one of those four I would like to be within my life. But there's an appeal given here to the gardener or the owner of the vineyard. The appeal is, let's give this one more year. Have you ever heard the saying that time is a good healer? It's not. Time doesn't heal anything. It's what you do with the time. I've met people over the years whose bitterness has got worse over time because of what they've used that time, it builds up resentment, builds up hatred, and their bitterness grabs them even more. I know people whose 
bereavement gets more significant over time. They miss someone more and more. Because time in itself is not a healer. Time, it's what we do with it that brings healing. There's an old saying that says, if we carry on doing what we've always done, we'll carry on seeing what we've always seen. That one of the descriptions of stupidity is to carry on doing the same thing and expect different results. And if you look at your life and you want to live under that expectation that I will be fruitful and yet you do not see fruit on your life, then just to carry on living your life in the way that you are and hope that one day it will change is probably naive. And the gardener didn't say to the owner of the field, he didn't say, just give it another year. Just come back in 12 months, it may have changed. The gardener was so convinced that things would change that he was prepared to put some investment in here. He said, just give it a year and I'm gonna dig around. I'm gonna dig around this fig tree and I'm gonna fertilize the ground. I'm gonna make sure that any negative influences into this fig tree are gonna be removed. And I'm gonna place intentionally some positive life-giving influences into this fig tree. And let's see if that brings about change. Let's see if the circumstance of how this tree looks, let's see if it fulfills its potential by doing that. See, there was a process here, there was a review we had a tree that was made and destined to be fruitful and the review said it wasn't being fruitful. Then we've got a time that gives space for digging to be done and then we've got some fertilizing to go into that. Now it's important that we note that when you, I'm not much of a gardener, okay? And um, in fact, all I said about authenticity, I'd quite like a plastic lawn. You know, it just to, to hoover it rather than mow it, it sounds much more appealing. You know, to see flowers that, you know, never, never die, that they're always in full bloom, plastic flowers, you know, it sounds ideal. But the reality is, if you visited someone's home and that was what it looked like, you'd look and think, it's plastic. <laughs> Sorry if your garden is like that. I'm sure it's really nice, I'm sure it saved you loads of time, but it's plastic. Not real, not real. Because when soil, it brings challenge of growth, it brings challenge of weeds, it brings challenge of all sorts of things that come up with that. And if you're digging around, you have to be careful that you don't pull the roots up, or you don't dig into the roots. You know, sometimes I see some people, they review things, and they, their temptation is to wipe the slate completely clean. So I'm going to take some time out from God right now, because I just need to, I need to dig around this. And you're not digging it, you're killing it. You have to keep to the roots of what this is about. Yeah. You have to keep true to the things that are a part of what God has made you to be. Yeah. Don't just start a revolution, but have a revelation. Yeah. And you dig around it. You keep the roots and you fertilize it. A good friend of mine, the general superintendent of Elim, he says, dig it, dung it, and then destroy it if it doesn't produce fruitfulness. I find this a real balance in life because we're talking about the fruitfulness in God, but let's relate this into some of our circumstances. I, I can be, I think, really persistent. Nita says stubborn. There's sometimes a great similarity between two of those things. In, um, in my life, there are some things I've been really passionate about and I may have kept going on them too long because I, I've been ignorant, I've been so persistent, we're gonna make this happen, that we just keep going and going. I remember a number of years ago, I had this big idea that we would, and I, and I, and I wake up with a million ideas a day, but, um, so it wasn't unusual, but I had this idea that we were gonna create this, this website, this national website that was gonna be a prayer 
um, resource and people would log in and they'd get their churches logged in and they would leave prayer requests and they'd have people ability to put videos up that they could pray over the needs and, and it, was, it was like a big fanfare, we called it I Prayer, that was a really cool name, bought the domain and um, you know, I, I, put, I put thousands and thousands of pounds into this thing and uh, we invested in it and um, it just wasn't catching. It just, there was something missing. So persistent or stubborn, Mark, thought, we need to do more. We need to invest more in this. And it needs more time. Now, I want you to know that's a godly thing. Because we live in an age today where people think, it doesn't work, move on. Oh, no, we've had an argument. Let's divorce. Oh, no, I, you know, I, I, the job's awful. I'm leaving. You've only been there a day. And we live in that sort of world that's very much light on effort and persistence. And I want you to know that in the Christian faith, if you have no perseverance, then you will miss out on about 80% of what God has got for you. If we as a church don't know what it is to press in and keep persisting and keep faithful, the scripture says, be be faithful in well-doing, then we will miss out on so much of what God's got for us. There needs to be a grit and a determination. But there's a time where you just have to pragmatically say, we've dug around this, we've fertilized this, and it's not happening. And I put some more money into that website. We put some more investment into it. We put more marketing into it. We brought more team in to help it. And um, it just didn't work. And, uh, you know, this was a bit difficult and embarrassing because we launched this nationally. There were churches all over the country that, oh, what a great idea, wonderful. Well, why didn't you use it then? (laughs) And I had to come to a place where actually the appropriate thing for this right now is to free up the space that's taken to put something that's going to be fruitful in its place. Now, I'm not talking about your life. I'm talking about some of those things that you're involved in right now. Some, you've got fruitless relationships and you need to invest in them. You need to fertilize them. Stop saying, oh, it's not a fruitful relationship. Invest in it. Give into it. Put nutrients into it. Build trust into the relationship. And look for fruit. Go into it expectant. I am going to see fruit. You know, when I meet people, and you know, many of you I've spent time with and you've poured out your hearts and you know, I've got a list of all your sins here. No, no, I'm not joking. <laughs> Do you know, when I, I, I hope that you know, when you've shared some deeper issues with your life, that when you see me outside of those contexts, that you're not thinking, oh, Mark knows all that stuff about my life, but that I hope that you feel so affirmed and built up because I've seen fruitfulness in you that all we've been doing is digging around the tree of your life, placing some ideas for some fertilizer, and then releasing you to be fruitful. Because I believe that's what the church should be. Some of you in your business ventures, and your workplace, you know, we just have to believe that God's purpose is for fruitfulness. And if it's not happening, we don't walk away, we dig around it, we fertilize it. And if nothing happens, there comes to a point where we say, I need to free up this earth for something else right now. And I believe that what Jesus was saying here is that we should spend our lives looking for fruitfulness. Now, of course, there are seasons. There are things beginning to grow in your garden now that weren't there a few months ago. Because there are seasons. But... If there is no fruitfulness, something is wrong. And we need to give God the space to help us to address those things. I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to invite the Holy Spirit to search your heart right now. I'm going to ask you to review in your life, first of all, the expectations that you have about your being. Jesus said that 
we should go and bear fruit and fruit that will last. It says that in the Gospel of John. That God is looking for His people not to be busy, but to be fruitful. And in your life, doesn't matter how long you have known Jesus, doesn't matter how long you've been coming to the church, doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter what your background is, God is looking for fruitfulness to come. And I'm going to invite you to pray and say, God, do I have the same expectation of fruitfulness on my life as you do? If I don't, I need your help. Just invite him now to come and search your heart. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're not a, an offsted like inspector, but you're a liberator of fruit. And I pray that there would come a fresh revelation in our hearts now, that you have purposed us for fruitfulness. Maybe you look around your life and you see that God has got purpose of fruit for you, but you're not being fruitful right now and you haven't been fruitful for some time. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will come and bring wisdom on the areas to dig around, the things to remove, and the things to fertilize and invest in. Bring wisdom right across this room. Gifts of wisdom to your people. Those watching online, bring gifts of wisdom. May we fertilize fruitfulness within our lives. Help us to be good stewards of the time that you've afforded to us in order to fertilize and prepare for fruitfulness. I'm just going to do a couple of things right now. I'm going to ask the worship team if they'll come and join me on the stage. And There's a, a wonderful symbolism in the scripture of oil. We read of it expression in so many ways. We read in James, book of James, that call the elders of the church and they will anoint you with oil and sick will be recovered. We, uh, we read it, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It's like oil that pours over the head and runs down Aaron's beard and it just brings just a beautiful sense of the presence of the Lord over our lives. It's really important that we understand that really the anointing and the oil of the Lord's presence is the real thing that flows over our lives. But this oil is like a symbol. It's nothing, it's come from Israel, which is lovely and really appreciate that. And they've got slightly different aromas to them. But um, I'm gonna ask us, as an expression of not just the symbolism that God has purposed me and you to be fruitful, but as a symbolism of our unity in believing that one another is fruitful, that we create a culture here that is committed as people come into this river family, as they come into one of our congregations, as they, as they gather with us online, that they come into an environment where everybody around them believes in them. And we're not religion, we're not religious, we're not going to look and see the sins in people's lives, we're gonna see the potential fruitfulness that's in them. And that's not just something for us to culture and cultivate out the front, we have to do it, because we have to model it and be consistent with it. It's really important. 
Leadership has a great responsibility in that. Scripture says that I as a leader will be judged more harshly, not just for how I've taught, but how I've been consistent in my living with my teaching. I've got a tougher judgment. And anyone who's got a heart for leadership, bear that in mind because you need to weigh it up carefully. But it doesn't just happen with the people at the front. It happens when we as a family, we say we are committing to be this culture that when I talk with someone afterwards over a coffee, I will not just see someone who's unburdening their issues and their challenges. I will not just judge them by what I see on the exterior, but I will look right into the depths of their being and I will see fruitfulness on their lives. And I will do my utmost to say, let's bring that fruit out to the surface. Let's create a church and a culture that says every one of us are going to be fruitful vines. We're not going to live under fear. We're not going to live under intimidation. We're not going to leave, live under insignificance. We're going to live under a belief that God has called us to be fruitful. What I'm going to do, maybe a couple of stewards could help me. I'm going to pass one, start in the middle here, and one goes one way, one goes the other. Just... I'll take the lids off in advance and I just ask you just to dab it on the end of your finger, just a little bit of oil. And then, this is important, I'd like you to ask the person behind you. And it may be that there are empty seats behind you or there might be that there are empty seats in front of people. And I want to ask you to make sure that everybody's got an opportunity for this. But I'd like you to ask them, can I anoint you for fruitfulness? If they say no, don't be offended. We want to be a place that people can be themselves here. In fact, God bless you for being honest and authentic and not sticking plastic fruit on just to try and fit in. You be honest and be real. But if they say yes, just take the oil, just touch their forehead with it and say, I anoint you for fruitfulness in the name of Jesus go and live fruitful lives and then as that prayer is taking place the oil will then move on to the second row and the same thing tip it over a little bit on your finger turn to the person behind you or the people behind you there might be more than one and say can I pray can I anoint you for fruitfulness and the same principle and let's right through this room let's anoint one another with what God has purposed on our lives, which is fruitfulness. Might be some people at the back. Look for our stewards. If you need to walk around upstairs, you know, some of you might want to go and find our kids' workers downstairs, or even our, you know, with parents' permission, even talk to our kids. And um, I believe that every one of us, God has purposed to be fruitful. Amen. Is that all clear? Make sense? Okay, all we need to do now is um, should we just pray for the band as the ones right at the very front and often the, when we read some of those advancements in the Old Testament it was the singers and the musicians who went ahead of the people and uh, let me just anoint these guys and then maybe I know this is a bit of a difference to plan but maybe we can just put our microphones and our instruments down for a few minutes and then go and pray for people on the front rows and those on the sides as well so Father thank you for Al thank you Father that you have anointed him for fruitfulness in the name of Jesus. Thank you for Chris. You've anointed him for fruitfulness. Thank you, Father, for fruitful anointing on his life. Thank you for your fruitful anointing, Lord, upon his life. Jesus' name. Anointed for fruitfulness. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Be fruitful in the name of Jesus. Be fruitful. May your life be overflowing with fruitfulness. Anointed for fruitfulness in Jesus' name. Fruitful. Fruit grow out of your life. Pour through your life. You'll be a catalyst of the fruitfulness of other people. Fruitful in Jesus' name. Fruitfulness. Speak fruitfulness over your life. In Jesus' name. Speak fruitfulness over your life. Be anointed to bear fruit in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Okay, guys, if you want to just pass these along, just take a bit of oil and then pray for some people on the front. And um, 
don't forget to include the front people on the side wings as well. Should we all stand together a moment? Can I, can I encourage you? There are two postures right now. Maybe the stewards can just help make sure that the oil is being passed along in a second as well. But there's a posture of us, we're just putting some oil on foreheads. That's one posture. But the other one is an opening up of your spirit to say, God, I receive your words over me, which are words of being anointed for fruitfulness. I invite you to have that posture. Fruitful. Anointed for fruitfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be fruitful. Thank you. Be fruitful. In the precious name of Jesus. Be fruitful. And when those in the front have been prayed with, if you're particularly receiving from God, don't feel you have to rush that, but when you've been prayed with, then the oil tub should be being passed along. Get some oil on your fingers. And then don't forget to ask the people behind, can I pray with you? Can I anoint you with oil? Isn't it great that we believe in the priesthood of all believers, that we can anoint one another yes. in the name of Jesus? Amen. Amen. That this is not just a function of some people at the front, that each of us are priests before the Lord. Because we have one high priest in Jesus, and he has empowered his church, his people, to be his hands and feet in this world. You are his hands and his feet. And in just a moment, before we conclude our time together and before we have refreshments I'm going to I'm going to ask us to because this is this is culture creating really yeah. what we're doing right now that's right. I'm going to ask us to um, to not do something that's quite timid I'm going to ask us to do something that's quite bold and up front I'm going to I'm going to ask us to call out of one another fruitfulness We've anointed, we've declared that's what God says over our lives. We've identified that we're participants in that by anointing one another in oil in the name of Jesus. But uh, I want to celebrate the joy that we believe is going to come. And because, uh, you know, it's not expectancy if, uh, if we don't believe it's going to happen, you know. It's not, we're not just in an exercise of just saying, oh, this is a really nice thing to do. This is like because we expect it. Because we expect you to be fruitful. Amen. Because if you're stuck right now, we believe that God wants to change it and we believe we will see fruit on your life. Amen. And, um, and I'm going to ask us that when, when you go to a, a theater or a film or a concert and something good happens in front of you, you we tend to culturally applaud it. To say, that was amazing. That was fantastic. And I, and I want us to give a, a prophetic cheer for the good that God's going to do in each other's lives. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, I, I want to liberate you to this because um, I, I want to encourage us not just to look to the front and cheer. I want us to, as we cheer, and, and please, if it's like, a, oh, yeah, 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 well done, well done. If it's like a, you know, a, a civilized little... Um, you know, I'll use my own culture, Welsh version, then, you know, it's not going to be displaying that sense of faith that we have, that the fruitfulness is going to come out of our lives. This is a rejoicing thing, guys. We were once lost in our trespasses and sins, but now we've been made alive in Christ, and He's purposed us not just to survive, but to thrive in fruitfulness in our lives. And, uh, yeah, I want us to call that forth in rejoicing. If you want to stand on a chair, you can do that. Just health and safety. Make sure you're stable. Make sure you're not going to fall on the power of God or any of that stuff. But if you want to walk around the room and go up to someone and say, come on, I believe in you, then I want you to do that. And I want us to give the biggest sense of celebratory cheer because we genuinely believe that God, as we look around the room, calls fruitfulness from our lives. Then... I want to encourage us. Are you ready for this? Do you understand what I'm saying? 
You understand the significance of what we're doing right now? That we're saying we're going to be a place that's going to celebrate what God's going to do. Come on, let's lift our voices. Let's celebrate all God's going to do. We believe in you. You're called to be fruitful. You are called to be fruitful. You are called to be fruitful in His name. Fruitful in the name of God. In Jesus' name. Well done. Well done. The fruitfulness of God on your life. Celebrate God's goodness in you. Celebrate all God's going to do in your life. Celebrate the fruitfulness of God on you. It's going to grow fruit in you. It's going to bring fruit out of your life. You don't know freedom and joy and fruitfulness. You don't know breakthrough and fruitfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's called you to be a fruitful people. Fruitful people. Fruitful in His name. Fruitful. Yeah, yeah. And we declare that this will be a place that we yeah, celebrate yeah. and expect and be a place yeah, of fruitfulness. Yeah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Jesus' name. Yeah. And over every relationship we speak fruitfulness. Yeah. In the name yeah. of Jesus. Over every yeah. business venture yeah. we speak fruitfulness in the name yeah. of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.